Good morning, everyone. It's time for another morning Bible study. I'm your host, Logan McCulley. We are now back from Cozumel. Now, my goal in Cozumel was to take like three mornings and record some Bible studies. Me and my wife had some time. However, I got sick and it was not great. There were, I didn't sound good, didn't feel good. There was two days, and thankfully they were storming days that I just would wake up and go back to bed. Wake up and go back to bed. I just felt awful. I had junk all in my lungs. I picked up an inhaler. When I hit the inhaler, my lungs finally like opened up. I was like, whew, buddy, I'm sick. And then I had to sit there and translate everything of like, what is Tylenol in Spanish? For you to know, it's paracetamol. Uh, just so many things to try to like have to like doctor myself in Mexico. It was it was it was a lot. It was a lot. And the funny thing is, is that we went to a church service in Mexico. It was like the only Baptist church that we could find, and it was cool. It was cool. But I sat down next to this woman. So Jennifer's on my left. This woman's on my right. And she goes, "Hey." Uh, I just want you to, I'm feeling a little under the weather today. I hope it's okay if I sit next to you. I said, oh, it's fine. It's fine. I've literally been sick for like 10 days now. Just poof, 10 days sickiness. Like I had to travel back in that time. Still went snorkeling. And I sat down next woman. Was she the one that I caught it from? Maybe, maybe not. But I have this needy suspicion. If she, she kind of go, <coughs> I'm a little sicky. Don't be, don't, don't worry too much. I, that should have been my sign to say, you know what? It's cool. I'll go sit in the back. It's cool. It's cool. You have the seat. I should have done that, and I didn't do that. And now I've learned. So, lesson learned. But just the overall trip was a lot of fun. It was super cool. Me and Jennifer got to spend that one-on-one -on -one time together that you just don't get sometimes, you know. As life speeds up, you know, you got scout activities, get to school activities with the kids, you got your job, her job, church activities. Sometimes it's hard to break away and make that time. That gave us some time to just relax together, be ourselves together, not have to constantly be on together. It was very nice and very needed. And if you're sitting out there and you're like, oh man, that sounds great. You don't even have to go to Mexico to do it. Just take a week and a half. And I think the, the key is going somewhere and be like, hey, I'm out of town. You can go camping, you know, if, if funds are an issue. But the point is where people can't just call you up and be like, hey, you free to work tomorrow? That is the key. And me and her were able to just disconnect and reconnect in each other. Now, it, like I said, it has been 10 days since I really sat down and dug in with y'all. Uh, man, I have honestly been missing it. And this is something that, that I truly enjoy doing. So today it's Proverbs 12. And this is just a continuation of our contrasting Proverbs. So I think we're just going to hop in with Proverbs 12.1. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. <laughs> is stupid. That's what it says. Stupid breakdown. From the Hebrew word to graze, he is as stupid as the brute cattle. Interesting. I didn't know that was like the root word of stupid, to graze, as the brute cattle. It kind of reminds me of like that face you, when you look at a cow, like that like chewing cud face. Not much going on in there. Verse 2. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked intentions he will condemn. The Lord will condemn the man of wicked intentions. Hmm. A good man obtains favor from the Lord. So the Lord, again, knows all, right? So he knows your intent behind what you do. If you're doing it out of wickedness, and you know when you're doing that, like all of us have had that, I guess, devil whispering in our ear, or like, you know, intrusive thoughts of like, hey, you know, what if I just took this fine china and threw it? You know, that kind of thought. If you have those wicked thoughts, he will condemn you. Or I guess if you act on those wicked thoughts, because you have to have the intention behind the act of wickedness. Verse 3. A man is not established by wickedness, but the root of righteousness cannot be removed. Break down of the word root. The familiar image is of the righteous being firm like a flourishing tree. A flourishing tree. 
but the root of the righteous cannot be removed. A man is not established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous cannot be removed. So he's like a flourishing tree, deep root system. You cannot be removed. I like that because it does paint the picture that says a man when he can't when he's getting established so whether being established in a job or as a parent or whatever it is a man cannot be established by wickedness but the root of the righteous cannot be removed if you're righteous I mean so there's like multiple things that go with that so it's going to take time because the trees take time to grow it's going to be a process it's not going to be overnight then when it actually happens, it's going to be over time, you're going to have that root system built in to where now that you're established in whatever you're established in, it's that much harder to remove you. Whereas if you do that wickedly, you won't have that root system. Verse 4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who calls a shame is like rottenness in his bones. The breakdown of excellent wife. See notes on Ruth. All right, so Ruth 3.11, the verse is, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. So the breakdown for Ruth is breaking down virtuous. For the breakdown in Proverbs 12, 4, we're talking about excellent wife. Virtuous woman and excellent wife. In all respects, Ruth personifies excellence. This same language has been used of Boaz, a man of great wealth or likely a man of valor, thus making them the perfectly matched couple for exemplary marriage. So we're talking about a woman that personifies excellence. And in verse 4 of Proverbs 12, it says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. I like how the Bible talks about treasure. Because the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter gold, silver, nor jewels if you don't have an excellent wife. If you don't have that in your life, you will be missing something. So when you do have that excellent wife, it is truly like your most pride and joy. It's, your, it's the thing you can hang your hat on tonight. But she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. The rottenness in his bones, this is speaking of suffering that is like a painful and incurable condition. I mean, I've seen it, man. You know, you got buddies whose wives aren't like, well, I guess it's, it's generally, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to say this without sounding convicting or convictful, that I got buddies who are not believers in Jesus, don't know Jesus, know of him, don't know who he is. You know, I mean, I'm trying to work on them, but... Their relationships suffer. Their wife doesn't know Jesus. And there's just something that just doesn't connect up here. And I don't know if it's the Holy... They're just missing God. They're missing the Holy Spirit. But you can see it in their relationship and how they deal with each other. And the problems that like he has with her and she has with him. The things that they do to each other. And it is like the representation of this rottenness in his bones. It's tough, man. It's tough. Knowing Jesus and reading the Bible is not for having a good marriage, right? However, that is a benefit. You do end up having a better marriage. And you know, my wife is working right now. I'm just going to take the time to text her and tell her that she is the crown of me. I want to say that. Hey, baby, you're, you are an excellent wife, and you are the crown of my life. That is what I'm going to text her this morning. It's sent. Proverbs 12, 5. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. The words of the wicked are, in quotations, lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. So let's start with the verse 5 first, and then we'll move into verse 6 again. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsel of the wicked are deceitful. It's saying the internal thinking. Oh, I get what it's saying. It's saying the motivation, the internal thoughts, the heart problems of the righteous are right. 
However, the counsel of the wicked which you speak outside are deceitful, not even talking about what's happening on the inside. We don't know what's happening on the inside, but you can see that the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. Verse 6, the words of the wicked, and it says are, I feel like that's a weird translation. It's, it should, I think it should say the words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. So the words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. Gosh, I wish I could remember that story. There's a, I hate saying story, but there's a Bible story talking about, and I think it was early in Proverbs, how the wicked wait to mur to steal, kill, murder on the road. And that's what this feels like. The lie in wait for blood. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. But... As those words lie in wait for blood, the mouth of the upright will deliver them. You know what? It says C notes on Proverbs 11, 1 and 12. Let's go see. Oh, this is the story I was talking about. So it's Proverbs 1, 11 and 12. This is what they say. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole, like those who go down to the pit. That is the story I'm talking about. The breakdown, when it says, come with us, the intimidating force of peer pressure is often the way to entice those who lack wisdom. So the words land wait for blood. And when it says swallow, the wicked devise a plot of deception in which the innocent are captured and victimized, like one who is taken by death itself, as with Joseph and Daniel. Sheol is the place of death. For the wicked, it is a place of no return in darkness and torment. Mm. Man, the Bible references itself so many times, it's hard to keep it all straight. But the mouth of the upright will deliver them. Proverbs 12, 7. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. The house, breakdown, the rewards of wise living are not only to individuals, but extend to one's household or family. Promises of the Bible. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. The rewards aren't just for you, the individual, but for your family. Verse 8, a man will be condemned according to his wisdom, but he who is of perverse heart will be despised. I think that one's pretty straightforward. You will be condemned according to his wisdom. And condemned, I don't know if that always has a negative context, but it can be always according to your wisdom. So he who is of perverse heart will be despised. Not just disliked, despised. You will know. I guess that person that you see, that you see that has perverse thinking, wicked thinking, will be despised. Hmm. Verse nine: Better is the one who is slighted but has a servant, than he who honors himself but lacks bread. The breakdown: Better and then than. This is one of several proverbs which makes a distinct comparison using better and then. When it says slighted and honors himself, the obscure one of the lowly rank who can at least afford to hire a servant because of his honest gain is better than the one who falsely boasts about his prominence but is really poor. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Better is the one who is slighted but has a servant than he who honors himself but lacks bread. Oh, this is like all those people that buy these cars on loans, that buy the big houses but barely can afford the mortgage payments. All these people that live a life that they, tr they really can't afford. Like they're covering it barely, but they really can't afford it. It's much better, it's saying, to be the person that like lives in a modest house, drives a used car, and is able to go and do, and what does he say, has a servant, so you can be slighted as in made fun of for what you're lacking for all the showboating you're not doing, but you still can afford to have a servant. That's so interesting. I'm telling you, man, the Bible's full of stuff. The Bible is full, full of good stuff. Proverbs 12.10. 
a righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. The breakdown. Regards and cruel. He has concern for the condition of his beast, while the wicked has no concern for people. I'm going to read it again. A righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Verse 11. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. He who tills his land, so he who is working, will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. Those who follow frivolity, the breakdown, energy expanded. In worthless pursuits and fantasies is as useless as outright laziness. Ooh, interesting. Those who follow pursuits and fantasies is as useless and outright laziness. Mmm, man, that makes me wonder. That makes me wonder, like, stuff like my YouTube and my... Well, is YouTube, would you consider YouTube in fr frivolity? I don't know. But man, doesn't that make you question things? Like, should you really be reading like that fantasy book? Like, is it worth the time and the effort? It's just as bad as laziness. It can be. It can be. Maybe. Maybe. Whatever you're considering, is it as bad as laziness? Is what you're doing worth the time you're putting into it? Does it move you toward kingdom goals? Does it enrich you to be able to better pursue those things? I don't know, man. I, I really don't. Got to be careful of that. Verse 12 through 14. The wicked covet the catch of evil men, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through trouble. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hand will be rendered to him. That's a lot. That's a lot that we just said. Let's break down verse 12. The wicked covet the catch of evil men, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. The covet catch, this refers to the desire of, for booty gained by schemes of the wicked, contrasted with a simple life of obedience that produces blessing. So like those people who lie in wait to still kill, they might have a large catch, but it's ill-gotten gains at the expense of others. We should not covet the catch of evil men. The root of the righteous yields the fruit, yields fruit. I like it when I like the root, the root that slow growing but stable root yields the fruit. Man, I feel like there's something there's there's like a a sermon in there somewhere. I don't know how to get at it, but I know it's in there. I'm read thirteen again. The wicked is ensnared by the transgressions of his lips, which is pretty straightforward, right? Like the wicked gets ensnared by what he says, but the righteous will come through trouble. Not that trouble won't come, but you will come through the trouble. I think that's important. Verse 14. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Okay, so the wicked ensnared by the transgressions of his mouth. A man will be satisfied with the good by the fruit of his mouth. And the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered to him. The breakdown. This deals with the power of words. The reward of wise words is like the reward for physical labor. I had a paramedic one time tell me that words matter. Words matter. Words matter. He didn't really explain it too well, but it kind of like rolled around in my brain and stuck there. Words are the only representation of what we have going on in our brain. Words matter because they represent thoughts. Not because, oh, words roll off my back like water off a duck's back, right? Like, you've heard that before. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words are those representations, and they're important. Words matter. How you talk, what you say matters.
And in here, it matters enough to be a reward for physical labor. It can matter enough for that. Verses 15 and 16. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who needs counsel is wise. Not needs, heeds. Heeds counsel is wise. A fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. So the breakdown, let's start with 15. The fool is right even in his own eyes. This is why feedback's important. This is why feedback's important. You have to take that feedback. If someone calls you out on something, don't just wash it away. Don't just, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. There might be a reason why someone's reaching out to you, trying to like rebuke their brother. The fool will think you're right in your eyes no matter what you do. So be careful. Keep that in mind. Don't always be right in your own eyes. You do make mistakes. Everyone is infallible. Like, or not infallible. Like, you can fail. Like, there's things that you will do wrong eventually. Just be aware of that. That's all you have to do. Just be aware you will mess up at some point. And probably often, to be quite honest. But he then who heeds his counsel is wise. So the flip side of that same verse is those who accept their counsel and actually use what they've been told, that feedback is wise. Because the fool's going to do whatever he thinks is right and continue to do it, even though it might be wrong. And 16, a fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers his shame. So covers his shame. A model of self-control, the prudent man ignores an insult. Ooh, okay, that, that, okay, so you take in that context. The fool's wrath's known at once. So if someone says something or does something, I'm bad about this. I'm going to be honest. Sometimes when someone bows up at me or, you know, spits in your spits at you or however you want to say it, husses, fusses, and cusses, my first instinct is to be like, oh, no, oh, no, we're not doing that here. That's not happening here. However, a prudent man covers his shame and ignores an insult. That's probably, that's going to be some room from growth for me. That's exactly what that is. Verse 17. He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit speaks the truth. In court, the truthful witness promotes justice. So he who speaks the truth promotes justice and declares righteousness, but a false witness then declares an opposite deceit. Verse 18, there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. The contrast here is between cutting words that are blurted out and thoughtful words that bring health. Again, it's talking about how words are important. What you say matters. So be careful with what you say. God wants you to be, or being in God, you should be the tongue of the wise that promotes health, the thoughtful thoughts that promote health, not the blurted out sharp tongue, cut them down at the knees. I'm actually way better than I used to be about that. I used to be really bad about just like pop, 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 coming off with whatever first comes to my mind. If it's hard to say, it doesn't matter. I'm going to say it like, but there's, there, there's a definitive difference between being honest and being mean. And then being nice. You can be honest and you can be mean. You can be honest and you can be nice. I used to be on the side of honest and mean. I'm just calling me out like I was. Uh, I am getting better about being the honest and nice. Like, oh, saying what needs to be said. Uh, definitely addressing issues if there's issues. But no need to call someone out when there's n no reason to call them out in a mean way. If that makes sense. Verse 19, the truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. I think that's pretty straightforward. Truthful lips shall be there forever, be established forever, but a lying tongue is only but for a moment. I put in the only, is only but for a moment. It will not be there forever. Lies will be seen Everything you do will be known. It is known now by God. So, like, keep that in mind. Like, what you're doing in secret, what you think you're doing in secret, will be known by everyone, but is known by God right now. I'm going to say that. I'm going to talk about this because, you know, we're pretty far into this podcast and this show. I have a cousin that just got divorced. And the reason why she's getting divorced or is in the process of getting divorced 
and this has all just come out like last night. Like I got a weird text message from my mom with a picture of something off of Facebook because I don't really read Facebook that much. Uh, it said, it's from my cousin, I'm not going to say who she is, but she's getting divorced. And the reason she's getting divorced is this guy ended up cheating on her and was cheating on her for six months. And she's, she was going through like fertility treatment and stuff. And this guy was cheating on her and it's all come out now. And now they're getting divorced. They've only been together for like two-ish years. And the reason why all this came out is my brother saw on Facebook that the guy was getting engaged to someone else. And he was like, what the heck? Are they divorced? I don't even know what's going on. And then it all came out that he was cheating and whatnot. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, because everything that you're doing will be known. Obviously, he was doing something in secret that he thought was in secret. And he was cheating on his wife. Which is really bad all on its own. And I cannot stress how awful that is but there is something to say that when they got married i didn't think this was weird at the time but now i know looking back that there was already blood in the water there was already issues because when they got married they didn't do it with any kind of religious affiliation they didn't do it in the bible they didn't have any scripture read over them they didn't they don't they're not churchgoers they don't believe in god because they didn't want god really a part of the ceremony now they set themselves up for failure because God is everything. God is like legitimately everything. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know God, you don't know the Holy Spirit, you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's tough. Like, life is tough as it is. Like, God is the way to make it easier, you know? Like, there's this free gift. That, like, you're on your way to hell. Like, we are all on our way to hell. We deserve hell. Jesus is there. He has paid the sacrifice. God gave his only son. Like, there is something to be said that when you're, like, staunchly against having God involved with your wedding ceremony, that is a flag on the play. There are underlying issues that you have with God. Fast forward two years, and then there are some issues that also have grown out of that, that have come out of that communion, that relationship, that marriage. And I hate it for, I hate it for, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what I would do or how I would handle that. I don't know if you can honestly know how you would handle that until you're in the situation yourself, until you've lived that life. But we're not close, so I'm just going to pray for and be there for if I see her, if she comes up and visit us, I'm just going to do that. Because that sucks, man. But what that guy did became known, and that was the whole point of it. What that guy did became known. What you're doing will become known. Whether it be good or bad, it will be known. It's kind of like the flip side of that, of like him doing something bad in the dark and doing something good in the dark. When I was in EMT school, it was kind of interesting because like, I guess this is me saying I was doing something good in the dark because like my friends and family had no like verification that I was actually in EMT school. Like didn't ever see me at school didn't see me going to clinical, to class. Like, I would just be like, all right, I'm going to class and work. And I had the realization one day, like, when I was getting toward the end, I was like, there's no way to know, for them to know, if I'm actually in school. Like, there's no way. Like, they don't pay for nothing. They don't do nothing. But at the end of it, when I graduated, I was like, come to my graduation, obviously. It's my dad, my mom, my brothers, and everybody. I was like, come to my graduation. And then, boom, here we are. You get to see the thing that I've been working on for the past year. I was working on my paramedic license. He was working on another woman. So just make sure what you do is for the Lord, not for self-indulgence. Verse 20, deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. The contrasting parallel is implied, not stated. Those who plan evil by deceit have no joy because of the risks and dangers in their plan. But the righteous who lead by peace fear nothing and thus have joy. And again, I'll read that verse 20 again. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. This kind of reminds me, I had an instructor one time tell me that he doesn't ever have to worry about getting pulled over by the police. I was like, okay. This is when I was like a teenager. And I go, okay, he goes, because I don't speed. 
I don't break the law. I have zero worry that I will ever be pulled over because I do not speed. There is no reason I obey all the traffic laws. There is zero reason for them to pull me over. It was kind of like an aha moment. I was like, well, I speed all the time at the time. I was like, I'm always kind of looking out for cops. You don't have to do that. That doesn't have to. You can just remove that thought, that anxiety off your brain if you live your life by the rules. God gives you this like plan of life. Like this is what you should be doing. You live by that. You don't have to worry about anything. God will take care of you. That's like one of the promises of the Bible. It may not be what you want, but he's going to take care of you. But the righteous who lead by peace fear nothing and thus have joy. Verse 21 and 22. No grave trouble will overtake the righteous, but the wicked shall be filled with evil. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. All right, let's start with 21. No grave trouble will overtake the righteous. I love that. It's not saying that you're not going to have grave trouble, but no grave trouble will overtake you. But the wicked shall be filled with evil. Here's the flip. But the wicked will be filled with evil. There will be, a, you will see it. It's going to happen. 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. Two things with that, okay? One, he's t you're seeing that if you deal, what does he say, or fill, or, lie, or lying, you are an abomination to the Lord. So it's saying, don't lie. You know, that's one of the commandments, right? Yeah. But the flip side of that, those who deal truthfully are his delight. That makes me go, oh, man, I, I mean, make sure, like, double-check, recheck yourself, you know. We, as humans, we all, our natural provocation is to move, slowly drift away from the Lord. So every time you, like, read a Bible verse, I feel like that's a good way to reorient yourself toward what you should be doing. Following God, following, following God, that word follow, it roots from, a, I think, a Greek word, that talks about a ship, a ship following the stars. If you're a navigator on a ship, you're looking at the stars, you're following the stars. Does that mean that you're going to be on a straight line directly under the stars the whole time? No, that's not how the ocean works. It means you're going to get kicked off course. You're going to have to readjust. You're going to get kicked off course. You have to readjust. We're going to get kicked off course. Am I being truthful in all the things, all the things, even the little things? What'd you do? Would you, where were you at? Where you been at? You know, simple things, simple things, like things that you don't want to be honest about. Like, hey, are you free to come help me? Yes, but I don't want to. You don't want to lie. You can't lie. You got to be honest. Hey, are you free to work tomorrow? Yes, but I can't because of my wife. I mean, I'm being honest. Like, I got to spend time with my wife. Like that's, that's, that's a legit thing. And I, I do do that. Like I, if someone's like, Hey, can you work tomorrow? And it's like, I've worked three days and she's worked two off one. So if we've been away from each other for four or five days, we got a day off and then when we work that day, I'll straight up say, now I got to spend time with my family straight up. That's been work a Sunday. And I straight up said, Hey, I don't work on Sundays. I'm free, but I don't work on Sundays. I go to church on Sundays. That's going to be kind of hard for me to continue as a nurse practitioner, I think. But if I just say it from the front end, hey, I don't work on Sundays, you've got the standard. Verse 23, a prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims foolishness. Unlike the fool who makes all hear his folly, the wise person is a model of restraint in humility, speaking what he knows at an op appropriate time. You hold that knowledge until it's time to be useful, but you don't sit there like the fool and proclaim and proclaim and proclaim. You hold it and you wait until it's useful, until it is knowledge. I think everything's knowledge in the right scenario. Everything is something to be known in the right scenario. That's why I think every single person knows something you don't know. Like Bill Nye one time said, that he's in this exact scenario, everybody knows some, is an expert at something that you're not. And he said specifically, he goes, I'm going to tell you something that you've never thought about. That if you ever have to get splashed with water, untuck your shirt. Doesn't make any sense. You think you get less wet 
it doesn't matter. Like if you're going to get splashed with water, it doesn't matter whether your shirt's tucked or untucked. I'm going to tell you from experience that it does matter. You will get way less wet if you untuck your shirt. The front of your shirt, untuck it. The water rolls right down. Doesn't matter if it's cotton, polyester, satin, doesn't matter. I've done it in all the shirts. If you untuck your shirt, you'll get less wet. His point was being that he had experience in this one very specific scenario because of his show Bill Nye the Science Guy that when he got splashed with stuff and his shirt was tucked versus untucked, he could remarkably tell the difference in how wet his clothes ended up being after the fact. Every single person has an experience like that. And if you're in a situation where you need to know how much water to not get on you or how to get the least amount of water on you, he would be the person that has the knowledge in that situation. It wouldn't be knowledge if you're at a pool and you're talking about it, or if you're here in Antarctica and you're like, hey, when you do science experiments, untuck your shirt. It wouldn't be knowledge there. It'd just be like, okay, that's weird. But it could be knowledge in that specific situation. So a prudent man conceals his knowledge, but the heart of the fool proclaims his foolishness. Let's move into verse 24. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Unlike the hardworking people who have charge over their work, the lazy are eventually forced to go to work for the diligent to survive. I think it's a, this is showing and it's important that those who diligently work and those who constantly work and consistently work will rule, but the lazy men will eventually be put, be for, be put to forced labor. I think it's a promise of like, hey, if you're doing this, this will happen. But also, hey, if you're doing the, if you're being lazy, you'll be put to forced labor. So you, you get to choose which one you want to be, but, but one of the two eventualities are going to happen. Verse 25, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Don't be anxious. Have security in your God, number one. But a good word makes it glad. Does that mean we need to be the person that brings the good word? That we need to share the good word? Are we talking about sharing the gospel? I think so. Verse 26. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Oh my goodness, this is a good one. This verse could be understood as saying that the righteous guides his friends carefully, unlike the wicked who leads his companions astray. I also straight up read it as the righteous should choose his friends. Be careful who you surround yourself with. You will be an amalgamation of the people you surround yourself with. Be careful, because you will be the addition of all those people, the blend of all those people, How? because the wicked will lead you astray, lead them astray. So don't lead your friends astray. Don't be around people who can lead you astray. Be careful who you keep around you. Verse 27, the lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting, but the diligence is the man's precious possession. The sluggard lacks commitment to make something of his opportunities. Ah, the lazy man does not roast what he took hunting. He just kills it and lets it go to waste. That's his opportunity to make an amazing food. But, the, but diligence is man's precious possession. Your diligent is your precious possession. Be diligent in your opportunities. I mean, that calls me out, honestly, for... Like any opportunities I have with jobs and healthcare, like, should I stay with nephrology? What's God's plan? I don't know. I can just pray about it. Pray about it. Keep my eyes open. But I can't let good opportunities go to waste. I have had nephrologists offer me positions. Should I take them? I'm praying about it. I don't know. But I shouldn't let good opportunities go to waste. I'm definitely not going to get a license and then not use it. Like, that's kind of what that is. Like, you just killed a license. Like, you got a license. You got to use it take that opportunity 28 in the way of righteousness is life and in its pathway there is no death hallelujah hallelujah and righteousness is life in the pathway there is no death 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He died for our sins. He died on that cross. He came back. So can you. There is life after death. You have to believe in Jesus. Jesus did it for us. We didn't deserve it. He lived a perfect life, a perfect life, and died in a gruesome way for our sins. Don't miss that. Don't miss that at all. That's what this is all about. Like, there's so much good stuff in here. But, like, the, this whole thing's about Jesus and what God did for us. So, that's the point of the story. That's the point of the Bible. Like, don't miss it. Even though there's so many good things in here about how to live, who to live, what to do, how to do it. In every situation, like, I don't think there's a situation that's not touched in the Bible. I've yet to find it. But it's about Jesus. That's it. That's Proverbs 12. I hope you enjoyed this Bible study. I will see you next time with Logan McCulley on the Morning Bible Study, guys. Hey, before you go, though, make sure you like this. Logan out.